Hey everybody, I'm Master Larry Huggins here in Barcelona, Spain, and uh, welcome back to your good life. I'm going to try again to get this episode done. This is the third try. The last one had no audio. And so here we go. Uh, Father, thank you for everyone who's watching, listening, receiving, and achieving the good life that you have for us in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's uh, let's see what we can do here. This is going to be brief, but uh, I uh, I just don't have any quitting sense. I just keep on until I get it right. So thank you for indulging me. Um, in a previous episode, I mentioned 22 proofs why Jesus was always the king, and I'm going to deal with. Uh, well, I have five on my list here, but I'll probably only do two or three today. Uh, and the first one has to do with his pedigree. And uh, what I want to talk about is uh, the angel Gabriel knew he was a king. And I, I think that's a pretty high authority, you know, the archangel Gabriel. Uh, here's what it says in, in Luke 1.30. And the angel Gabriel said unto her, Mary, fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in, a, in your womb and bring forth a son, and you should call his name Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. Now listen to this. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. In other words, he's going to be the king, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now, Gabriel, archangel, chief angel, they are warring angels, and they're also messenger angels. Uh, we know of two by name, Michael and Gabriel. In this case, it was, uh, it was Gabriel, and he appeared unto Mary, and he gave her a message straight from heaven. Now, let me talk to you about angels. They do not have uh, a free will. Their assignments are given by God, and they faithfully carry out those assignments. <laughs> they don't have the liberty to uh, be self-directed. They don't have the liberty to change their assignment. And when they're given a message, they must give that message exactly as it was given them. They can't change that message. They can't say, well, listen, I have a message, but I've been thinking about it, and I'd like to, I'd like to just modify it a little bit. And I know God said this, but no, no, that's not how it works with angels. They are required to be faithful in their delivery of the message. Okay, so God speaks through angels. They are his messengers. He speaks through angels as though God himself were speaking through the angel Gabriel. And it was not Gabriel speaking, but it was God speaking through the agency of Gabriel. Uh, let me give you an example. Right now, if you can see this little shiny thing, where is it? There it is on my uh, collar. That's a microphone, a wireless microphone. And I'm speaking into the microphone. Very simple. And the microphone is transmitting what I'm saying to the computer, which is uh, going over the internet to your computer, and it's coming out of the speakers or headphones, and you're hearing exactly what I'm saying. Along the way, the computer doesn't say, uh, well, I think I'll rearrange these words here and give them a different meaning. No, the, the uh, computer is a, is a, what shall I say, disinterested instrument. It doesn't have a will of its own. It's uh, not here to correct me. It's here to transmit what I'm saying. And if I had a microphone and a computer that changed everything I was saying, I'd be in trouble. I'd want to get rid of that and get me something that would uh, say what I'm saying. And so what you're hearing right now is my voice, but my voice is coming through the internet. So Mary heard God's voice and it was coming through 
the angel. And what did that voice say? That you're going to have a son and he's going to reign over Israel forever. And he's going to sit upon the throne of David. In other words, he's going to be the king of the Jews, the king of Israel. And the angel, Gabriel, knew that Jesus was the king. And Mary, at that time, knew that Jesus was the king. The actual, hereditary, bona fide king of the Jews. Perhaps king in waiting, but nevertheless, king. He came into the world to be the king. That's what he was, and people recognized him as being the king. Today, a lot of people think that he was just a homeless carpenter who had, you know, some of these ideas that he went around teaching, uh, you know, about peace and kindness. And I'm, I'm not trying to make fun of, of that or those people, but there's much more. You know, there's much more to this story than, than just uh, him speaking on the Mount of Olives and giving us the Beatitudes. Thank God for the Beatitudes. Beautiful Sermon on the Mount. But... There's more to Jesus. He actually presented himself as the king, and he conscripted as the king, and he made decrees as a king, and he dressed as a king, and he commandeered as a king, and he lived as a king. And if you've been listening to my episodes, he actually lived in a palace. Now, you may ask yourself, well, why hasn't anyone found that palace? Because if they found Jesus' palace, it would be like finding the Ark of the Covenant or Noah's Ark, and people would venerate and worship that thing, and it would become an idol. So if someone found Jesus' house where he lived, then, uh, you know, uh, people would be selling tickets to see his house, and folks would be crying and kissing the uh, the rocks and the foundation of the house and having all these uh, strange emotional experiences, which, which pilgrims and Christian pilgrims in Jerusalem uh, have to this day. They have these these uh, strange emotional uh, reactions. People who've never really been religious go to Jerusalem and all of a sudden they, they become religious and they, you know, they walk up the Via de la Rosa to the 14 stations of the cross and they fall down on their knees. I've seen this and, and kiss the rocks and they cry and they're overcome by the fact that Jesus walked on these stones and Jesus slept here and Jesus, no. <laughs> In fact, uh, that road that Jesus walked on is 25 feet below the present road, and people are kissing this, this road up here under their feet, but the archaeologists have uncovered the, ro the road during Jesus' time, during the rock uh, Roman occupation. I've been to it. You have to go underground, and they've excavated it, and you can't actually step on the stones that Jesus stepped on, uh, but you can see the stones and the grooves from the wagon wheels from the Roman occupation, and uh, it's 25 feet underground. So I don't know what these people are kissing up there. They imagine that they're kissing the stones that Jesus' beautiful feet walked upon. Um, and, and you see, people would do that. These things would become relics that people would venerate. I hope there's never any archaeological evidence for a Noah's Ark. Uh, there'd be a you know, there'd be a whole other sect and cult grow up around that. And I hope there is never uh, any archaeological evidence for the Ark of the Covenant. I know you watched, uh, you watched Indiana Jones and it's in some warehouse in, in Arlington, Virginia. No, no. Uh, you know, the Ethiopian uh, Coptic religion, uh, all these little churches claim to have the Ark. Uh, and, and it's kind of like during the you know, the earlier years of the Catholic Church, everybody had a, a holy relic, a, a bone from one of the apostles and one of the saints, you know, a toe, a bone from a toe or a finger. And I've seen them. They put them in glass cases and people weep and cry over them. And uh, a few years ago in San Jose, California, uh, there was a, kind of a spectral phenomenon that happened uh, in this woman's house. She noticed when the light came through the window at a certain time of the day, that it, it created a pattern on the wall that uh, if you squinted and looked at it, it would kind of look like Jesus. And the church in Rome uh, sent some people out and investigated it. And they said it's a bona fide miracle. 
And all the sudden, uh, thousands and thousands of people are coming to look through this window into this woman's house and see an image of Jesus. And it was nothing more than just a spectral highlight. It was, you know, an optical phenomena. It wasn't supernatural. But people see things. And that's why I hope no one ever finds evidence of where Jesus lived. We have biblical evidence. We don't need anything more than the Bible. We don't have to... We don't have to touch it or feel it or, you know, kiss it or anything like that. Let me tell you something. Uh, everyone, everyone uh, in Israel during Jesus' day, I, I say everyone, the general population knew he was the king. All right, enough of that. Let's see if we can uh, do at least one more. The Magi, the, the, uh, the wise men who came to worship Jesus, they knew he was the king. Now, there's a lot to this story. Uh, if you look at Matthew 2.2, 2, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he uh, that will be given the throne of uh, David? Where is he that is the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star, his, his day spring, his day star in the east, and we come to worship him. Now, that word east is not talking about a cardinal direction. It's talking, the word actually means uh, the uncovering or the revelation. They, they came because of the uncovering of the revelation of the Messiah and when and where he would be born. And that's what they call the day star, which are the prophetic messianic scriptures that pointed to the exact time and place where Jesus would be born. In fact, Herod, when he heard this from the wise men, called in all the chief priests and scribes and said, okay, where's the king of the Jews uh, to be born? I want to know so I can go worship him. And they all said, Bethlehem of Judea. <laughs> you see, uh, they were expecting the king. Simon was expecting the king. Anna was expecting the king. Uh, the high priest and the scribes were expecting the king. Other nations were anticipating that this great king of the Jews who was prophesied, who would be greater than Solomon, would be born in Bethlehem, and they sent, they sent caravans and trains with ambassadors and servants and soldiers, and these are big deals. They sent them to uh, Jerusalem. Now, um, they didn't go to Bethlehem. They went to Nazareth. <laughs> And they didn't go into a manger. They went into a house. Let me read it to you. Uh, Matthew 2, 11. And when they, the wise men, were coming to the house, they saw the young child, not the infant, with, his, uh, with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. They did obeisance to them. They submitted themselves to him. And when they had opened their treasures, plural, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And that word worship means to pay homage. Our obeisance are to express respect or to make supplication. Praise God. And the storehouses, you know, we, we see these pictures and greeting cards of these old dudes on camels, and one of them has a little box with some gold in it, and one of them has a little box with, you know, we suppose to be myrrh and another one with frankincense. And in the, uh, in the Catholic tradition, and, and Protestant too, in the Western tradition, uh, we say, Three wise men. We three kings of Orient are, you know. And, and how did we come up with the idea that there were there were three kings? That's not supported by scripture. Well, they they enumerated the treasures: gold, number one, frankincense, number two, myrrh, number three, one, two, three. Each one had a, a little gift, so there must have been three wise men. No. The Eastern tradition, the Coptics and the Orthodox, believe there were 12, and they're closer to being right. In fact, the Bible enumerates them. I, uh, I may miss one here, but they came from Kedar and from Tarshish, which is uh, present-day Spain. They came from Ethiopia, Egypt, uh, Sheba, Seba. I, I'm leaving some out. They're all, they're all listed, and uh, there are probably 12 and maybe more. And they came the same way the Queen of Sheba came when she visited Solomon and brought him gifts and, and paid obeisance to him. She wanted to have a relationship with this great king. It was in her best interest. 
and the best interests of her kingdom to have, you know, uh, treaties or alliances with the kingdom of Israel. So she made a journey of 1,500 miles across the desert, which took her three years, which is half the time it normally took. And she came with an army, a Cheo. Uh, the queen doesn't come with, you know, $400 billion worth of treasure uh, without being protected. And she needs servants and she needs livestock and she needs food and she needs pavilions and she needs all this stuff for this three-year journey. And let me tell you something, she didn't rough it. Uh, they would move ahead. The logistics were amazing and set up a camp and she would come there and then they would leapfrog ahead. And three years later, uh, she's in uh, Jerusalem meeting with Solomon, giving him all these presents. And uh, that happened with these wise men. They didn't come alone. They came in chails, which are a great force, a great army, and everything they needed to transport these amazing treasures. And that word, uh, that word treasure is interesting. It means coffers, storehouse, repository, and, um, and the, the root word uh, tithe me. Isn't that interesting? Tithe me is to, uh, to make one's use or to establish. These treasures were to establish them in good relationship with the kingdom of Israel and uh, the new king, Jesus to establish them, to, uh, to put them in the right position. They, they, had a, they had a political motive behind this. They came not to worship him in the sense of holy, holy, holy. They came to worship him in the sense of old great king, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we're your humble servants. And uh, it's, it's not like people think that, that was not a religiously uh, motivated journey for the wise men it was in their best interest and the best interest of their kingdoms. Now, take, uh, take the kings or the wise men who came from Tarshish. That's 2,500 miles away from Israel. Yeah, and it's not east, it's west. <laughs> but they had the same day star experience because they were studying the same scriptures. And, uh, and, and so Tarshish uh, was in present day Spain. Of course, this is important to me because I live in Spain, and uh, it was a Phoenician colony or outpost, a seaport on the Iberian Peninsula near the Pillars of Hercules, or what we call Gibraltar, uh, near the present-day city of Cadiz. And that port was a, was a trading center for the Phoenicians, who were the masters of the sea. Anyone who traveled on the Mediterranean generally traveled on Phoenician ships because they had a monopoly. They dominated. They were the best navigators and sailors in the world. Um, I've got some things I could say about the Phoenicians. Very interesting group of people. You know, Solomon uh, was in uh, partnership with King Hiram uh, from Phoenicia, which is present-day Lebanon. But they had these outposts. And uh, the outpost in Spain was a hub for trading with Europe and Africa and gold and silver and spices and precious jewels and ivory and that kind of stuff flowed through there. And then it was shipped to wherever it was going. They were merchants, seafaring merchants, big fleets. Now, when they, when they sent off uh, uh, their goods across the sea, they didn't send solitary little boats. They sent big ships, uh, big cargo ships, which could also carry passengers. And they went in convoys of 50 ships at a time protected by military ships. So this is a big armada. This is a big marine force that sails. Uh, and uh, it's done seasonally because of the, the weather and the, and the prevailing winds. And so to get to, uh, to Israel from Tarshish was uh, minimum 90 days, minimum 90 days. And think of the logistics, because they had to have all these people, just like the, the uh, overland you know, uh, caravans had to have a lot of people, soldiers, servants, uh, administrators, so forth. Uh, these convoys had a lot of people. And they brought a lot of stuff and, and the logistics was great and someone had to send them. So uh, people in Tarshish knew about the day star. They knew about King Jesus. People in Ethiopia knew about the day star, King Jesus. In Egypt, they knew about King Jesus and, and all over dozens of countries. And they all collected uh, these great treasures and transported them 
guarded by armies. And they all started at different places at different times, and they arrived in Jerusalem at the same time. <laughs> wow, is, is, that, is that providential or what? Is that uh, divine? Absolutely. And it, it shows how precise their understanding was of where uh, the king of, of the Jews would be born, Bethlehem of Judea, Bethlehem of Judea. But they arrived two years after he was born. But they still arrived all at the same time. And I think that is amazing. Uh, another uh, testimony that, that reveals the hand of God in this. Praise the Lord. I, I think the real story is so much better than three old dudes on camels. You know, the Bible says that, that when these uh, wise men came, that, uh, you know, asking about the king of the Jews, that Herod in all of Jerusalem was in, was in uh, a great turmoil. Why would three old guys, old dudes on camels, upset Herod, who had his own army, who was the tetrarch, who had the protection of the Romans, who was in, uh, in cahoots with the Jews? Why would that upset him? I mean, uh, he had the temple guards. He had his own uh, army, uh, garrison. He had the Romans and their army. Why would they be upset? Because they were invaded. Jerusalem was surrounded not just by three old dudes and camels, but uh, the, the armies of 12 different nations. Man, wow. You know, we need to not let other people do our thinking for us. We need to question things. We need to be like the Bereans, who they were more noble than those of Thessaloniki because the Bereans searched the scriptures daily to see if these things be true. And you and I need to take the advice of the Apostle Paul and be like the Bereans and search the scriptures daily, not just accept tradition, not just accept what other people say, not just accept church creeds, but find out what the Bible says. In fact, what I'm saying to you, uh, if you go to the website, you can find blogs and I have the scriptures, you know, they're all in print. You just go to cchurch.life and look in, under blogs on the menu and you can see all these blogs that I've written. I think I've written somewhere in the neighborhood of 22 blogs on this subject. And I've got a few more left to, left to do before, um, this, before I'll bring this to an end. In fact, I, I think I'm going to do about three or four more episodes, then I'm going to, I'm going to stop. Uh, I have much more to say, but it will be in the book that I'm writing, Codex Rex. So uh, search the scriptures and see if these things be true. This idea of a star in Bethlehem, there was never a star in Bethlehem. The wise men didn't go there. There were shepherds, there were angels, but there wasn't a, and there was a manger, but there wasn't a star. That, was, that event happened two years later. You see, we, religion just puts this all together and uh, tradition puts it all together. And you know, uh, Hallmark and, <laughs> has sold a lot of Christmas greeting cards with nativity scenes and most of the nativity scenes are wrong. And little pageants they have in church with the three wise men on Christmas, wrong, 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 uh, wrong date, wrong cast, <laughs> wrong script. But, uh, you know, it's very nostalgic and religious people like that stuff. Well, let me tell you something. Religion sucks. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And as long as you and I are holding on to tradition, it is voiding the power of God in our lives. Jesus said that. He said, uh, your traditions have made the power of God void. And so you can have either the power of God or you can have tradition. Choose one. I'm going with the power of God. I'm going with truth. You are too, right? Okay, listen, write me or contact me, Pastor Larry at zchurch.life if you have any comments, questions, criticisms, or what have you. And I'd like to consider those before I put Codex Rex into print, uh, the book of the king. And who knows, maybe your comments will, will find their way into my book. I'd appreciate your help. It'll be printed later on this year. And uh, the other thing is go to zchurch.life and give into your good life. Sow a seed into your good life and get a, get a harvest of blessings. Zchurch.life. This is Ambassador Larry Huggins in Barcelona saying, Adios y que te vaya bien. Sometimes the most beautiful things 
and be